no one gets to choose their parents, we all inherit a story, like it or not. But we can choose what to do with that story. I'm Mike Joseph. The story my parents gave me was full of life and loss, wars, genocide and ethnic cleansing. What should I do with that legacy? What would you do? I was 50 before I did anything at all. Welcome to Keys, a troubled inheritance. My mother Lily was born and grew up in Leipzig in Germany. That was the only country that she knew. Her father had fought for Germany and was decorated for his First World War service. But because he was a Jew, Germany refused him German nationality, even before the Nazis took power. That same year, 1924, my grandfather bought an apartment block in Leipzig and moved his growing family into one of the flats there. Was that a mistake? It bought them some protection from the gathering Nazi storm, but in 1938 the Nazis suddenly expelled him and his family, including my mother, from their home and from Germany. The SS forced them over the border into Poland and then sold their home and the whole apartment block to Nazi journalist Ralph Dippmann. That's what Nazis did. In 1951, Communist East Germany awarded my mother's house to the same Ralph Dippmann again. That's what communists did. Here I am, 40 years later, climbing the stairs of my mother's house. This is still owned by Ralph Dippmann. Who lives here now, apart from ghosts from the past? On the ground floor by us and by Schürig, lately a big Nazi. Marie Nummer was the caretaker's wife and a great friend of my mother's family. In 1946, she sent my mother a vivid account of living with Nazis in the apartments during the war. But now, 45 years later, Marie Nummer is long departed, and so is the big Nazi Schürig. The first floor by the Seifertz and Gladysh, and Seifert is a terrible Nazi. Here are the nameplates. Yes, Seifertz and Gladysh are long gone. So there is Herr Knetmer, second floor. Here on the second floor, in the Knepper's apartment, today it's the Kirstens. Perhaps they're a new family. Should I speak to them? A family Laube, four people. And in your apartment, the Borst family, equally awful. Here on the top floor is the door of the Boost family. But this was my family's apartment, my mother's old home. And over there, what does that nameplate say? Lauber. It still says Lauber. Equally awful. Today, everyone here in the house claims to have been friendly to Jews. But they made life hell for your parents. They're still here, a family who made life hell for my mother's parents. Am I really trying to recover this house with all these people? Wednesday morning, my campaign to recover my mother's house starts with the state property managers. They run all of Leipzig's crumbling tenements. 40 years of Leipzig housing neglect tells you a lot about why the revolution which began on these streets and ended with the fall of the Berlin Wall started here in Leipzig. But there's been no revolution in this housing office. Dippmann is the owner as far as we know. Marie Nummer was paying you rent here in this very office way back in the 1940s. Do you still have records from those days? No, nothing. Our files go back no further than 1984. Well, that's only seven years. But this office has managed the building for at least 50 years. 
We have no papers. So, what's the first document in your files? The first document here is dated April 1984. It appoints Wohnungs- und Baugesellschaft as property managers. That is our predecessor agency. And who signed this document? Ralf Dittmann. Oh. Now, with our new management coming in from West Germany, this approval must be renewed. And you're going to ask Dittmann? I have already asked him for a new contract. And what if he declines? That would be no problem. Dittmann can have his house back to manage at any time. His ownership is clear. Now, if you don't mind, I have many people waiting to see me. The Remember Nothing Public Housing Agency doing its job in East Germany. A state that forgot its past in order to build its future. It was more convenient for this property to be owned by an East German Nazi than a foreign, Western, bourgeois Jew. You just needed to lose the records of how the Nazi came to own it. We walk across Leipzig to our next meeting. My interpreter Burkhardt and I, we cross a footbridge over a wide boulevard. A year back, Burkhardt was down there on the road, in the vanguard of the crowds demonstrating for a democratic East Germany. He could not have known how that would turn out. Today we're on a smaller mission, but even so, we do not know how this will turn out. The Neues Rathaus, Leipzig City Hall. Here is Frau Jordan in the newly opened office for property claims. At this time the office is open only for registering claims. You have many? So far we have registered 40,000 claims. That's East Germany? No, just here in Leipzig. Oh, and these are all Jewish claimants? Many yes, but also from West Germany, people who fled to the West. Oh, so what about our claim? Yes, it has been received, validated and registered, but no decision can be made yet. Uh, what if the Nazi owner sells the house in the meantime? So, to prevent your claim property being sold, I suggest you make a formal protest against registration at the land registry. I want you to look at this. In 1948, when he was really pressed by my mother's lawyer, Ralph Dippmann agreed to return the house, and that's his letter. Without prejudice to and in maintenance of my right to compensation from the Deutsche Reich or the present relevant authority, I am prepared to return the property to your client and to provide... The agreement of 1948 is not material. At the moment it is an open question how to deal with this kind of case. We will be asking Ralph Dippmann why and how he bought the property, then we make our decision. If he obtained it unfairly in 1943, then he forfeits it. The essence of the claim is, did he obtain it honestly? Look, you already have 40,000 claims. When will you be asking him? I don't know when we will ask. The Liegenschaftsdienste, the Land Registry, they will have his 1943 purchase paper. You must find them. Okay, but will they let me see them? You have an interest. You have a right to see them. Ask them. Well, okay, how about this evidence? These are letters that my mother had from 1948 to 1951 from the property managers. They were sending her regular reports about the tenants, about war damage, about repairs. They weren't sending them to Dittmann, they were sending them to her. Hmm. So it appears that Dittmann acknowledged that he is not the owner. This is useful evidence, but you must find the 1943 purchase contract. Perhaps it will show something like, for services to the Reich. Is that good advice? Or will the land registry turn out to be as forgetful as the property management office? But another question bothers me. Did East Germany take my mother's house because she survived the war and genocide by escaping abroad? Or because she was bourgeois and not deserving of restitution? Or because she was Jewish? Or maybe all three? Because East Germany's attitude to Jews was conflicted. As a loyal member of the Soviet bloc, it was anti-Israel and anti-Zionist. But many East German leaders were Jewish. Politburo members Albert Norden and Hermann Axen. Ministers of Culture Klaus Gysi and Alexander Arbusch. 
hardline justice minister Hilda Benjamin, married to a Jewish doctor, murdered at Mauthausen. And most notoriously, Marcus Wolf, head of counter-espionage. But then there was Fritz Grunsfeld, the Jewish lawyer my mother turned to in 1945. He was wartime leader of Leipzig's decimated Jewish community. He survived Theresienstadt camp and in 1945 returned to leadership of a community of over 14,000 at its pre-war peak, but now, after the Holocaust, fewer than a hundred. Restitution work was the core of his post-war legal practice. In an age of East German opposition to restitution, this put him directly at odds with the state. On 9th of January 1953, he was warned that anyone contacting Western Jewish organisations or pursuing restitution to Jews was liable to arrest as a spy. Hours later, Grunsfeld and many other prominent East German Jews fled to the West. He was expelled from Leipzig's Jewish community organisation and his leadership role was taken by party loyalist Aaron Adlerstein. I was on my way to meet Adlerstein. My mother corresponded with Fritz Grunsfeld in this office in the late 1940s. Are those files still here? We have nothing. Grunsfeld took all his archives with him when he left for West Germany. Do you contact him in West Germany? Yes. And he still lives there today. Oh. He does not help us when we ask. Really? Why not? He was head of the Jewish community during the war. He collaborated with the deportations and he was very much criticized by the community afterwards. Oh, well, my mother also wrote to you in this office in the 1950s and the 1960s and the 1970s. She, she never had a reply. I apologize for not replying. Well, why didn't you reply? She was a survivor of the great Jewish community in this city. All the time we have letters, phone calls, from London, New York. There are no settled claims yet. And that stopped you replying to my mother for 40 years? We also have our claims. We only know that the city has no money. I spoke recently to the mayor. He said if Koch came for his property, the city would have nothing. Kroch was a Leipzig Jewish banking family. Only months before Hitler won power, they completed an ultra-modern housing development in a new garden suburb for Leipzig, a thousand apartments in the Bauhaus style, despised and soon suppressed by the Nazis. One of the Kroch family survived the war and, like my mother, found refuge in Wales, in Cardiff. I knew him. He warned me against my mission. There is no place for us Jews in Germany, he told me. What will you do if you do get the house back? I had no answer to that. But if Adlerstein was right, then Leipzig's mayor didn't sound too keen for that to happen. Borkart now suggested meeting a colleague, Susanna Kucharski. She divided her office work between the Leipzig Green Party and the Jewish community office, Adlerstein's office. We met in the Green Party office in the Neues Rathaus, the City Hall. So you have been with Adlerstein? Yes, and he told me that Fritz Grunsfeld is still alive. Grunsfeld lives in Düsseldorf. We send him our newsletter twice a year. How come they didn't give you his address? Well, he didn't seem too happy to help. Did the office know about my mother's family, about Lily Gold? I know the name Lily Gold. She's recorded as a property owner on the Jewish Community Card Index. I have seen it. And there are also records of their deportations east to Poland. In the last year, we had 50 claimants visiting the office. I was always ready to listen. I heard everyone's story. Adlerstein's attitude was, look, I was in Auschwitz. What can you tell me? We don't talk about this. I told Adlerstein, let them use your archives. They have files. A 1935 card index of thousands of Jewish community members, letters going back to the 18th century. He has a duty to help, but he refuses. 
and when former Leipzigers visited the office and were upset to receive no help, I quietly told them, come back tomorrow, Adlerstein will be away, and I will help. So, what do you think of my mother's claim to recover the house? Your case is good, but today, Jewish property is a political question. What do you mean? I don't understand. Of course it's a political question. You have the unfinished business of two German dictatorships. Well, since unification, our economy has collapsed. There is now a political dispute about the restitution of property. You mean to Jews? Yes. 40,000 Leipzig properties are being claimed. The city has no money. Its economy has collapsed. The mayor warns the Jewish community office of unsustainable claims. And now the Green Party organiser confirms that restitution is a political question. A Jewish question. Perhaps Kroch was right to warn me there is still no place for Jews in Germany. Am I on a pointless mission? And then, for some reason, and I've no idea why I think Susanna could help, I ask her about the names I saw at my mother's house. Kirsten interests me. Marie Nummer did not mention them in her list of big Nazis. That matters because it's one thing to take the Nazi dipman's plunder from his hands, I would do that without regret, but another thing to make an innocent tenant homeless. In 1946, Marie Nummer condemned them all as active Nazis, but today it's 1991. What do I really know about the people in that house? They might soon be my tenants. Should I try to speak with the Kirstens? Elfriede Kirsten was a teacher in a 35th school in the city. I went to this school. Oh, and where is it? On Pariser Straße, opposite number 7, your mother's house. I'm on the stairs again at Pariser Straße, and this time Peter Kirsten welcomes me into his apartment. So, Peter, did you know the Gold family? Natürlich. Of course, not me personally. My mother told me. I was only... A uh, one-year-old baby in 1938 when the Gold family were deported to Poland. But we understood that the whole family then left Poland for London, yes? That is what we were told. Uh, yes, my mother Lily and just one sister Rose, they did escape from Poland to Britain, but only these two. The rest of my mother's family, her younger sister, her brother, her parents, and all their cousins and close relations, they were all trapped in Poland and that's where they were killed. I don't know how, I don't know where or when, but that's why, after the war, my mother had to contact this house, their old home, to see if anyone had survived and turned up. And Frau Nummer told her, nobody. Mm. Ach, that's, that's is so schlimm. Peter Kirsten has an idea, gets up, goes to his desk, and comes back with some paper. What's this? Oh. You should recognize these. Look at this! Israel Gold! Are these... 1931? Are these rent receipts? That is right. For my grandfather's rent. From your grandfather. And my grandfather signed these receipts. My goodness. But, but hang on. What's this? They're made out to... Paul Knepper. Yes. Paul was my grandfather. Elfriede's father. Your family kept these for 60 years. I hold this small receipt, signed by my grandfather and given to Peter Kirsten's grandfather. A trivial thing. But what does it say that this paper was kept safe in Peter Kirsten's desk for 60 years? As if waiting for me to see it. That's not what Nazis do. The house is in very bad condition. We've turned now to discussing the condition of their apartment, neglected both by Dipman and the state property managers. things down, but they do nothing. The condition of the flats is just left to the tenants. We have looked after our own. Could this be the start of a future relationship with these people? If we ever recovered the house? I'm in no hurry to end this meeting. A first moment of human warmth in Leipzig. But as I finally do leave, 
I comment on a striking piece of furniture near their front door. Nice. Ah, you like this table? Mm -hmm. It was a gift from Marie Nummer. You were friendly with the Nummers. Natürlich. 7 a.m. on Friday, a dark and bitterly cold February morning. Borkhart insisted we should arrive now to hope to be seen at the land registry in the basement of the Neues Rathaus, the city hall. Ten minutes after the doors open, the queue behind us already stretches out to the street. This is where 40,000 claimants have to come to learn what they are up against. We ask for the conveyance which gave Dippmann his title to Pariser Straße 7. The clerk refuses. Not possible. We insist. So does the clerk. We may not see Dippmann's deeds. It's stalemate. The waiting crowd behind us gets impatient. But we are not leaving. The clerk goes to fetch her manager. I'm thinking visitors must have been more obedient in the Stasi years. This is a rough introduction for these officers to the capitalist free market of access to information. The manager appears, expressionless. We repeat, we are here to see Dipman's conveyance and will stay until it is produced. She stands silently, thinking, then disappears for a minute to return with two documents, a 1941 deed of confiscation and Dipman's 1943 deed of conveyance. At last, some fragments of the truth. Anordnung der kommissarischen Verwaltung. Aufgrund der Paragraphen 1... Berlin, 27th of January, 1941. By order of the Haupttreuhandsteller Ost, that is the SS plunder agency whose business is to rob Jews and also enrich the Nazi state. The apartment block, Pariser Straße 7, property of the Polish Jewess Sophia Gold, is ordered to be confiscated. And then, two years later, the SS monetizes the theft by selling the confiscated property to Ralph Dippmann. Vor dem unterzeichneten Notar Paul Neumann mit Amtssitz in Leipzig. 30th of April 1943. In the presence of notary Paul Neumann, there appeared today one Herr Bankdirektor Diplom Kaufmann Eugen Schlossbauer, two Herr Prochorist Baumeister Richard Hoffmann, three Propaganda Company Sonderführer Ralf Dippmann of Taucher bei Leipzig, Sommerfelderstraße, declare that the property, Pariser Straße No. 7, is entered in the Leipzig Grundbuch the land registry in the name Sophia Perl Gold, born Kastner. The property is confiscated by the Haupttreuhandsteller Ost. The purchaser, number three, requests that his name is registered as the owner in the Grundbuch. Number three further declares that he is of Aryan descent and no Jews are party to the contract. The registered property owner is a Polish Jewess. Signed, Eugen Schlossbauer, Richard Hoffmann, Ralph Dippmann. We have our man, clause by corrupt clause. He sits down with the SS plunder agency. He acknowledges the house is stolen from Jews. He declares he is an Aryan and he signs for the property. A complete admission. And on top of that, the man is a propaganda company Sonderführer. What is a Sonderführer? Three floors up, here in the City Hall, Susanna Kucharski might know the answer. This document proves that Dippmann knew the house was confiscated. And what does this mean? Herr Sonderführer P.K. Ralph Dippmann. Sonderführer means that Dippmann was a Nazi journalist, a censor and propagandist. And the PK? It means Propaganda Compagnie. They were civilian journalists with military units. In the occupied Soviet Union, they produced anti-Jewish propaganda. Now we know how this Nazi propagandist dealt in stolen property with any regime, as long as it was German and how communist East Germany secured his Nazi contract in its vaults and relied on it for 40 years. Burkhardt, a disillusioned German radical, and I, a sceptical Welsh-Jewish journalist, sit in his apartment drinking tea. What do we do next 
I ask. Let's see if he's in the phone book, he says calmly. Numbers for Taucher are in a section at the back of the phone book because Taucher is a separate place, built for elite Nazis miles outside Leipzig. Borchardt finds him. Dipman, Ralph, Sommerfelder, 4, Taucher, 68620. On that snowy night in Leipzig, my daughter Asher was only a year old. Thirty years later, we talk about what happened and what might soon happen. Burkhardt really transformed this whole situation on that extraordinary day. He was my interpreter, he was my translator, he was the, the guy I had at, you know, at my side right the way through all these meetings. Uh, but he was a lot more than that. He was also one of the leaders of the Monday night marches that led to the peaceful revolution. I mean, he was a young guy who wasn't afraid to imagine the impossible. And I suppose anything at this point is possible. Uh, I was absolutely stunned at his cool in not just looking up this Nazi from the past and finding him in the Leipzig phone book. You know, he was about to pick up the phone and call him. And I said, no, no, hang on, hang on. You know, <laughs> that, that isn't the way to do it. No? So he said, no. Uh, I, I said, look, we're only going to get one shot at this. And so what we don't want is him hearing who we are and slamming the phone down and that's the end of it. Okay, you wanted to use your old door stopping method. Well, that's the way how I would have, I guess, done it as a, uh, as a journalist. And Borkard immediately picked up on that, said, right, we'll visit him. It was a dark February evening. Uh, Taucher is about 10 miles outside Leipzig, out into the country. And there we were, setting off in a Soviet-built larder through a blizzard to see a Nazi, what, 40, 50 years after he'd taken my mother's house. Um, I was really feeling torn between my instinct as a journalist to get the story, and my God, what a story could be at the end of this drive. And on the other hand, was that really what I was there for, or was I there to discharge a family duty, a responsibility to try to get my mother's house back. And was this a sensible thing to do? I mean, what would happen, for example, if I turn up out of the blizzard and the guy is so stunned to see someone claiming the house that he has a heart attack and he dies? I mean, that at the very least is going to, you know, okay, I was imagining that. I was imagining what would happen if he became aggressive and if there was some sort of bust up and the police were called. Anything could happen. I mean, the, 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 the one question is, what do you say to an old Nazi? What do you say? Too late now, we're at his door. A short, elderly woman opens it, unsmiling. Borkhardt says we are here to discuss a property. She waves us in, as if they were expecting us. We sit at a low glass table. She whispers, He can speak, but he can't hear. He is deaf. We wait for him to appear. An old man, blonde hair, so tall, so straight. Cigarette in one hand, in the other a heavy glass ashtray. Thanks for joining us for Keys, A Troubled Inheritance, an investigation by Mike Joseph into genocide, ethnic cleansing and one family. This was the third episode. For more information on the whole series and upcoming episodes, please visit mikejoseph.wales and see you next time.